So today we are here coming together for this auspicious event of the book offering ceremony for the support of the Sangha, of BGF, and also the Sahas Life Lunch. And I'm sure many of you, here, of you coming here with a very wholesome mind, with wholesome intentions to, to practice generosity for the benefit of the Sangha, of the Sasana. But I'm also aware that some of you maybe also have selfish reasons for coming here. <laughs> selfish reasons, I don't know what could be, just for the free food, a lot of makan afterwards. Huh? <laughs> Or sometimes also, you know, because you know all of this sangha is a very good field of merit, it's very meritorious, it's very wholesome to find worthy recipients of our generosity. So therefore, you kind of using us, using the monks as a field of merit making, so that you can go to heaven. <laughs> oh, very selfish one. <laughs> so I think nowadays, we have to be careful with child abuse, Women abuse, monk abuse, <laughs> using our monks just to go to heaven as a vehicle. Actually, this comes up an interesting question. One question that I have for you now. If you are generous and helpful to others, but you have a desire of getting something in return for our own benefit, not just for helping others, but for our own benefit, or maybe he gives me something later, or maybe I can get a good week uh, So you do it for that intention. Do you think such an action is wholesome or unwholesome? Or can we be very neutral? What do you think? If you give with selfish interest, because you want to get something back afterwards. I mean, I ask you to raise your hand if you think this is still wholesome. Raise your hand. Very few. Some. The selfish ones have raised their hands. <laughs> so raise your hand if you think this is unwholesome before you self interest with giving generosity. Raise your hand. Okay. Also quite a number. And raise your hand if you think it doesn't matter, it's completely neutral, not completely irrelevant in this case. Balance it out. Okay. Also some. So I think almost half half. Of those of you who will say it's wholesome, and the other half said it's unwholesome. So how do we settle this dispute now? <laughs> Does the majority decide? No. Actually, we have this important question about the Dhamma. There's one way or we can find out to settle our questions. Which is, you ask the Buddha. <laughs> of course, the Buddha has passed away long ago. But we still have access to the Buddhist teachings, especially through the suttas, the discourses, the words of the Buddha. And if we read the suttas regularly, we find answers, answers to many of the Dhamma questions that come up during uh, our data. So, if you have read many of the suttas, maybe you have come across one sutta in Anguttara Nikaya. It's called the Dana Mahapada Sutta. Dana Mahapada, meaning great fruits of generosity. And Amputala Nikaya 7.52. And there the Buddha speaks exactly about the question that we have just discussed. So let's see who is right and who is wrong. Maybe everybody is right. The Buddha speaks uh, to another Sai Buddha, the one disciple who is foremost in this thing. The Buddha says to him, Sadi Buddha, that is the case where a person gives a gift seeking his own profit with a mind attached to the reward, seeking to store up for himself with the thought, I will enjoy this after my death. The person who is giving something, maybe a bottle of water, <laughs> with the thought, Oh, when I am reborn in my next life, I will always get water in return. <laughs> so, Bobby will be blessed with a lot of water. <laughs> but nothing to eat. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so, somebody who gives this thought, he gives a gift of food, or drink, 
or clothing to pay here in robes, or a vehicle, or garlands, or perfume, or ointment, bedding, shelter, or a lamp, to a prophet or a contender. So in ancient India, they already had a tradition of ascetics, not only Buddhists, ascetics from all kinds of schools and traditions, and the people who support them. It's the understanding that it's very wholesome and that they will get something in return, especially after that. What do you think, Sarabhuta? Buddha asks. Might a person give such a gift as this? Is this possible? Yes, Sante, Sarabhuta says. Then the Buddha says, Having given this gift, seeking his own profit, with a mind attached to the reward, seeking to store up, to come up for himself, with the thought, I will enjoy this after my death. What will happen to him after death? On the breakup of the body after death, he reappears in the company of the four great kings. Chattumaharaj can give us. Wow, not so bad, no? Huh? <laughs> so, uh, or hope is not lost even for you selfish ones. <laughs> so you can still become one of the happy new company of the Chattu Maharajika Devas. Not so bad. So this is the first category of the person. And so, what do you think now? Is it wholesome or unwholesome? To give with the intention to get some benefit also for yourself? It's still wholesome. Otherwise, you wouldn't be reborn as a Deva. Otherwise, the coming desire could be a rebirth, maybe as an animal, or as a hungry ghost, or a rebirth. So, this is obvious, obviously still wholesome. And then the Buddha speaks of other types of intention that a person might have in giving a gift. For example, his giving, just thinking, giving is good. Just with that thought, with that understanding, giving is good. That also is wholesome and also leads to rebirth in the four great kings well. Or thinking, giving was practiced before by my father and forefathers. Meaning to say it's a long family tradition, the whole family was giving to the Sangha or to ascetics, so I also maintain that. So this is his thought, his condemnation. Again, uh, same with river, also. Or thinking, and then, this is my favorite, I cook. These people do not cook. <laughs> it isn't right that I who cook should not give to those who do not cook. And then they offer something. So, because you see all the monks here, they're not cooking. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, some people think, oh, these helpless monks are not cooking because they have many rules, otherwise they would have to starve. So, for that thought, a uh, person decides to give. So, it's also wholesome, of course. Or, thinking. Just as the seers of old, the sages of previous times, that is, Ataka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Isamita, Yamadakti, and so on, a long list of sages that nobody knows nowadays. Just, just as those sages held those great sacrifices, so I will share the gift. In ancient Indian tradition, there was always a tradition of sacrificing uh, generosity. Sometimes with animal sacrifices, which the Buddha did not encourage. But in the same tradition, the person considers, oh, I can also do my fair share in making it. No? So it's a different aspiration, a different thought and motivation. Or thinking, when I'm giving a gift, my mind becomes blessed, and elation and joy arise. So the person who understands, oh, every time I give something, I feel so happy afterwards. I feel good. I feel contented with my own good conduct. And on account of that, he gives. Because he understands, oh, it feels good to do good. Huh? The rest, uh, the Western countries, Christmas celebrations. I think here also in Malaysia, right? I said, in Malaysia, you celebrate everything. <laughs> the, the Christian festivals, the Buddhist ones, the Chinese ones. Malay ones, so many holidays. So in Western, well, Western traditions, they have these Christmas and the celebrations. And this is a tradition that usually Santa Claus, so parents and grandparents, don't tell anyone, are giving gifts to the children. 
And when I can't read open, I observe also how when my smaller uh, nephews and nieces, when they're receiving the items from my grandmother, uh, as for you, then unpack it. And you can see the child uh, be so happy getting a tractor or some kind of toys, a box car, whatever it is. But then I started to observe also the grandmother. And it turns out, when I look at the grandmother, she seems to be more joyful than the child. The child said on back to the same, oh, okay, well, very nice, okay, thank you, next. What else? <laughs> but actually, the grandmother, the joy in her face, actually, you can see she gets more joy out of giving than the children out of receiving. I found it very interesting. You could clearly see how giving makes the mind happy, joyful, beautiful. So this can be another motivation for generosity. Knowing that when I'm giving a gift, my mind becomes joyful and elation or piti and sukha arise. And then lastly, the Buddha says, a person that gift, thinking, it's an ornament of the mind, like a decoration for the mind, an accessory of the mind. And when giving a gift with this intention, a person is reborn in the companionship with the devas of Brahma's company. Ahmatarika Divas. Oh, this is the higher. So only if he thinks I do this for the sake of my Dhamma practice, uh, for making the mind wholesome and beautiful uh, as a support for the past to liberation, um, practicing Samatha Vipassana based on this generosity, uh, then it is even higher today than the Chattu Maharatika Divas, then you guys might be reborn uh, among them among Brahma's company. Huh? So these different motivations and intentions behind giving, but all of them are wholesome. So even if you think, oh, I'll get something good and return, uh, either in this life or in the next life, knowing, understanding this is not unwholesome. It's still wholesome. Huh? Actually, there's an interesting term that we get from the Abhidharma text. They distinguish the mental state it has two or three wholesome or unwholesome moods. Quick, hatred, and delusion, or non-quick, non-hated, and non-delusion. And actually one of the best ways of practicing generosity, one of the best ways is to practice generosity, but also with wisdom. Anya Sampayuta, associated with wisdom. Knowing Oh, this is wholesome. The law of karma, you can understand what is a wholesome deed, a meritorious deed. And actually, you have not only a loka, not greed, because you practice generosity. Also, there's no dosa, uh, no anger, and there's also a loka, non delusion, because you have wisdom at the time, understanding that this is wholesome. So, this is not an unwholesome, I understand. So I found it very interesting because it's a common misunderstanding, I think. If you think you do something, uh, hoping or expecting something good in return in the future, some people say this is unwholesome. But then here we learn from the Buddha, uh, from Buddha Empire, he said he's still wholesome. So then what to do now then with all the marriage that you will go to make very soon? <laughs> Buy a car. Heaven. Uh, some people also get married in order to pass an exam uh, <laughs> or come with sickness. Maybe there can be many aspirations, it's okay. But important also from my Dhamma perspective is that we don't stop there. We don't just make married and then move on. Of course it's okay, but actually the Buddhist teaching goes a step further. There's a conversation where the Buddha speaks with Mahan Mahama. In Ankutan Kai 11, and I uh, uh, read out the short passage here. On one occasion, the passive one, the Buddha, was dwelling among the Sakyans, the Kapilavatu. Now, on that occasion, a number of figures were making a robe for the passive one. So they were sewing robes for the Buddha, thinking that with his robe completed at the end of the three months of the rain's residence, the passive one would set out on the rain. Because it was tradition that during the three months of 
the master, he went to Buddha, he went to but then after the rainy season is over, he would go out, he would travel, visit uh, different places, and also different monasteries, and monks in different places of uh, Middle India. So he would wander. But the monks were preparing a rope for him, so that he has uh, new ropes, so that he doesn't have holes everywhere when he travels. Even though it's called a holy life, <laughs> but having many holes inside the rope is not what is meant, it's a holy life. <laughs> so they were preparing new ropes for the Buddha. Then Mahanama the Sakya, he's a lay person, not a monk. Mahanama the Sakya heard about this, approached the blessed one, and homage to him, and sat down at one side, and said, Hunter, I have heard that the number of monks are making a rope for you. And then after Vasa, he will probably set out wandering. Hunter, with all our various engagements, how should we dwell? So he's asking the Buddha, we, meaning him, Mahanama, and his friends, his family, our lay people, how should we dwell? How should we practice? And the Buddha says to him, Salu, Salu, Mahanama, good, good. It is taking for you to approach the Tathagata and ask this question. You need to say a good question to ask. Because he's asking, how should we practice? How should we dwell? Should we be contented just with making ropes for the Buddha? Or how should we practice? And the Buddha says, Mahanama, a person with faith, Sattha, a person with faith succeeds, not one without faith. So a person who has Sattha, confidence, trust, in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, will his life will prosper and improve and he will succeed, especially in the past of liberation. Not one without faith. Secondly, an energetic person succeeds, not one who is lazy. No? So it's encouraging him also to be energetic, to arouse effort, energy. Thirdly, one with mindfulness established succeeds, not one muddle minded. No? The views of India and there, distracted mind. Fourth, one who is concentrated succeeds, not one who is unconcentrated. What do you think will be number five? Any idea? Wisdom, Banya, exactly. One who is wise succeeds, not one who is unwise. These are the five ingredients, the five spiritual faculties, or the five powers, Banya. So the Buddha says, don't stop, they're just making robes. Uh, you should also practice these five spiritual qualities. This way, uh, you will develop. Uh, so, it's interesting, the Buddha here singles out this set of five, the five nutrients. It's been very important for the past generation. Nowadays, actually, we don't hear so much about these five. Sometimes we hear about them. But actually, there's a different set of ten that is much more popular. The ten baronies, right? But it's interesting. In the early suttas, actually, we have no reference to the ten baronies. And the Buddha often emphasizes, when he speaks about liberation, about the five hundreds, the five faculties that we just discussed, or the seven factors of awakening. So these are the qualities that are most important if you want to strive for awakening. Um, even though the Dhammaris, uh, the quality of those bad things are also mentioned in the suttas, sprinkled out in different places. But the kindness, virtue, uh, generosity, they are all mentioned, but not as a set that they need to cultivate to strive for liberation. They are sprinkled out as separate qualities to develop, but not as something that you need to do to become a Samasa Buddha, or to become an Arahant, and that is comes a little bit later in the development of Buddhist scriptures. So very interesting, Buddha emphasizes here on the five faculties. So, what are they? Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. These are the things we really need for liberation. And then, lastly, the Buddha says, Hey, establish yourself in these five qualities. You should further develop six things, 
Six more things. Wow, so much people, huh? First five, now six. I wonder what comes afterwards. Seven. No, oh, actually, this is the uh, only empty six. The six things that the Buddha recommends further developing is Buddha Nusati, a connection of the qualities of the Buddha, a connection of the qualities of the Dhamma, Dhamma Nusati, Sangha Nusati, Sila Nusati, a collection of the own virtue, Chaga Nusati, a collection of the own generosity, and Devada Nusati, a collection of the Devas. So these are six further things that a practitioner and a Buddhist disciple uh, should, should develop in time to time. So again, very interesting, the word sati comes here, anu sati. Sati means, some we can say it is mindfulness, but literally it means a collection. The Sanskrit term is smuti, smuti. Sati means memory, a collect. Mindfulness also is related to that. Sati. So we are collecting the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, for his own generosity, of virtue of the divas. So uh, we'd like just to focus on one of these six because today we have this wonderful event of the robe offering ceremony and all of you and all of us we make a lot of merit by participating in that. So then what to do with all the merit? Now you're doing all these wonderful deeds. Wouldn't it be nice also immediately to get some benefit from that? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you can harness you do not have to wait on the next life, or five lifetimes later, that even in this life, or even tonight, we can already get the karmic results of the good deeds. Wouldn't that be nice? Raise your hands if you want that. <laughs> Raise your hands if you don't want that. <laughs> the Buddha says to Mahanama, Mahanama, you should try to connect your own generosity in us. You should think it is truly my good fortune and thing that in a population and among people who are obsessed by the stain of my suddenness, of stinginess, I dwell at home with a mind devoid of the stain of my suddenness. I'm not thinking. Free and generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, Devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. So this is the Buddha says that Mahanama should correct your thinking this way. Oh, oh wonderful. I'm a generous person, I'm giving open handed and supporting my family, my friends, the Sangha, and so on. But then he says when a noble disciple can correct his own generosity on dedication, his mind is not obsessed by lust, or by greed, or by hatred, or delusion. Huh? Unwholesome states are not present at the time. No disciple, on that occasion, his mind is simply straight, based on generosity. Straight means also well directed towards the goal. And no disciple whose mind is straight gains inspiration in the meaning gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains joy connected with the Dhamma. Joy, who does not want joy? <laughs> when he is joyful, rapture arises. He, the one with rapturous mind, the body becomes tranquil. The body becomes tranquil. And one whose body is tranquil, the mind. Uh, the body also feels pleasure, and also the mind. For one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated, samadhi. This is called a noble desire who dwells in balance, a bit an unbalanced population, who dwells unaffected, a bit an afflicted population. As one who is under the stream of dharma, he develops the collection of generosity. So here we have an instruction by the Buddha to harness our own generosity and Reflect on that. Oh, I've been supporting so many people. Um, maybe your family every day in the morning when you prepare a meal. Or oh, maybe help a friend or something. Or give material support. Generosity does not mean only money. 
of the bar. <laughs> it also means time. Sometimes actually people don't even need your money so much, but they may need your shoulder, your time, your attention. So you have to see what people need and then give what they truly need rather than just drop in some cash. <laughs> Uh, especially when it comes to family members, or children, money might not, or does not solve for programs. So actually time is equally important, or something more important. Even in Buddhist societies, isn't it? Uh, Buddhist societies also we need funds and support, uh, of course, otherwise we cannot run our affairs. But then also if everybody just drops the funds, who will organize the events? Who will set up the chairs, the tables, cook the food, clean up afterwards, so many things. Actually, time and service is often more important and more needed than just another 200 ringgit or something like that. So it's important also to consider uh, time as a factor of generosity. And then by reflecting, wow, ah, I've been able to support this awesome. Or so many people, or my family, my friends, we can be light in that, in the purity of the mind, in the generous mind. We should not confuse that with pride. It doesn't mean you're okay. so proud now, or I'm better than everyone else, look how much I give. Not like that. Huh? There's a wholesome joy by recognizing oh, that the mind delights in wholesome things. And that delight is also that the fuel of future generosity. Because you know, oh, I do something good, and then afterwards I will feel good about that. So then that will motivate you to do even more good in the future. So this is not selfish when you delight in the purity of the mind and your own generosity. Huh? So this is a very nice way of harnessing immediately, or soon after you've done a smaller or larger act of kindness, of generosity, you can close your eyes. That you correct that wholesome deed and have a wholesome joy about your own good deeds. So, this is very much what I would recommend. Not yet now because we haven't done anything good. <laughs> <laughs> but on a later occasion, actually, some of you have seen already in the morning, you've been doing good already, helping out here in BGF, setting up the place, uh, preparing everything. Not just this, this morning, since days. And then doing also good deeds is not limited only to supporting, supporting the Sangha. Also all the good deeds that you do in your family, in the workplace, that you do with a wholesome mind and smaller or larger act of generosity, these are all the things that at the right time you can sit down and bring back. Oh, how wonderful. Mind is so generous, open-handed. Supporting others who you need. Oh, wonderful. Or you just do it for selfish reasons because you want to go to heaven. Up to you. <laughs> so I offer that for your reflection today and I'm looking forward for the rest of the ceremony and a little bit later also at the Dhammapada with the Kailas to a very nice chanting session where we can just together recite and, uh, some of the important discourses in the DNA time. Okay? So, wish you all the best and see you later.